since you since you tease your next episode, I need to see on the next episode uh, previously on old fashioned real estate and have me on there. <laughs> I'm an early adopter, so this kind of stuff comes out. I'm the guy that's grabbing it. The VR headset. We're flying. We're like a drone. So this one is the GoPro Max. You just cost Brian and I like twelve hundred bucks each. <laughs> Welcome to the Old Fashioned Real Estate Show, where hosts Brian Leverage and Jeffrey Holst pour out old fashioned real estate advice. Episode 37. All right, welcome to the, another episode of the Old Fashioned Real Estate Show. My name is Jeffrey Holst. I'm Brian Leverage. And we have a very special guest today, and I'm super excited about it. We have Dr. Ian Pearson. Um, I've known of your work for quite some time. As you know, we've interacted a little bit on Twitter, which you guys should all go follow him right away at Time Guide on Twitter um, because he's fantastic. He's one of the most accurate futurologists out there. And um, he has been kind enough to join us for the show all the way from Britain. So we really appreciate you coming on and thanks for being here. It's a great pleasure, Jeffrey, and uh, checks in the post. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I um, uh, Yeah, so listen, I've been a fan of your work for a long time. Um, obviously, you don't focus on real estate and you've made that really that's clear true. to me. That's not your area of expertise. You study the future and future trends and particularly in technology. So um, so I do appreciate you coming on and I wanna tell everyone in advance, we're gonna be talking about some stuff that might sound a little bit goofy, but because you're incredibly accurate, we can just rely on you to tell us the future, right? <laughs> well, let's let's assume that's correct for this evening, anyway. Fair uh, enough. It's, um, yeah, I'm I'm a futurist, and I'm a general purpose futurist. I'm not a specialist in anything in particular at all. I'm a supreme generalist. Uh, but some of my clients have worked in real estate. You know, people that build flats for uh, new starters. You know, just coming straight out of university. Um, people who make uh, um, buildings for uh, you know renting into office blocks. Uh, also, just general um, everyday life. I, I, you know, I write books on this stuff all the time. But it, I'm not a specialist in real estate. But it seems to me that some of the technology trends in which I am supposed to be a specialist, some of those will have obvious implications for uh, real estate uh, trades. So, you know, when we're talking about trends which affect urbanization or construction techniques, obviously they will reflect in prices and demand and so on, and increasing wealth resulting from technology developments also will reflect on real estate as well. So I'm quite happy to cover those areas, even though I recognize that I'm not a specialist in those areas. Uh, I should be able to offer some external perspective at least, which hopefully the viewers will find useful. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. So one thing that I've heard you talk about a number of times and write about um, is about the increasing wealth over the long term. And I think a lot of people fail to see this, right? I mean, a lot of people are, oh, you know, people are getting poorer and there's a bigger wealth gap and all this stuff is happening. But you've said many times that a conservative estimate is that we would have like a 2% net growth over a long period of time. And I think you've even pointed out because of compounding, that means that people will be significantly richer in the future. Um, how do you see that impacting real estate? Well, yeah, let's put some figures on that. By 2050, if you assume between two and two and a half percent economic growth, which is what we've been getting for the last 20 or 30 years, give or take the old recession or two, uh, if you assume that growth will continue through to 2050, that means we'll have between two and two and a half times as much wealth. That's a lot. That means you've got you know, well over twice as much money free to spend because your essentials, you know, the basic food and your, uh, your car won't cost that much more and so on. So you will have a lot more spare capacity to spend on other things. And that includes how much you want to spend on your property. By the end of the century, if you go to ahead to 2100, you'd be five times richer than you are today. So if you're thinking about investing in property today uh, with a view to maybe handing it on to your kids or your grandkids, uh, you may be looking at the 2100 perspective. That growth of five in how much wealth people will have should factor into your calculations. Because if people are five times richer, they will have a lot more money to spend um, on, on property. Uh, which property are they going to buy? Well, they're not going to buy boring property. They're not going to buy a boring property in the middle of a city. Uh, today, we use the uh, expression location, location, location. 
Well, you can be a bit more precise about that in 2100 or even 2050. You could say pretty, 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 because uh, if you've got a place which is really nice, a lot of people are going to want that place. And if it isn't really nice, nobody's going to want it. And if you've got loads of money in the bank, you can afford to pay that bit extra. But a lot of other people will have lots of money as well. So the competition for those very few places, which really are genuinely really pretty, you know, fantastic view out of the window you can't make those uh, there's only so many places which are in really prime locations with really pretty views uh, that, that there'll be lots of money to spend buying those properties so properties in those very pretty areas with very pretty views will go through the roof in terms of price and the differential between those and routine everyday properties in the middle of the city or the suburbs uh, that differential will increase dramatically because of that increasing average wealth so, you know, if I could make one single hint about the real estate market, if you're going to invest in the long term, buy something that looks really nice in a really nice location with a really nice view and your money will not be wasted. You know, it's interesting that you say that because, um, you know, I think that's something I've always said is like, you know, if I didn't have a job, I'd want to live on a beach. Right. So mm. um, it's the same concept. I mean, it's not just beaches, though. Right. You're talking about like mountain views. And, yeah, it's and, there are lots of different things that people mean by pretty. You know, some people want forests, some people want mountains, some people want a river, some people want a beach. Well, you know, that's fine. But there's not that many. You know, we all generally agree that certain places are pretty and they will go through the roof because there's a lot of people that will be around. We'll have 10 or 11 billion people with a lot of money in their pocket, all competing for the same small number of properties around the world. So even if you dilute those across the world, there's still only so many pretty locations, an awful lot of boring city locations, but people will be moving out of the cities. We're gonna see de-urbanization and technology enables that. So there'll be far more demand for those very supreme, perfect locations. That's so great you, news for Jeff because he's planning on living till he's three thousand anyway. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's true. I, I always already I, was. <laughs> I always tell Brian. I always tell him. I said I want to live to the energy death of the universe if I can figure it out. Um, that's and that's why I follow people like you actually because. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I've seen you, and this is, of course, way off of the real estate topic, but it does impact it in the sense that if people do have dramatic um, increases in life expectancy, their um, decisions about what real estate they buy is going to be significantly different. If you think you're going to live to a thousand, you might want to uh, purchase real estate sooner rather than later since prices will inevitably go up over time. Yeah, you're into the Star Trek universe once you go past about 200 years. Uh, we'll be traveling to other planets and we'll be setting up space stations and maybe the best uh, property you could buy is on the other side of the moon. You know, who knows? Uh, maybe it's on a space station somewhere. Maybe it's on Mars. Maybe it's even in a different uh, solar system. So, you know, if you go hundreds of years in the future, once you start talking about lifetimes around a thousand, uh, the real estate market, maybe Earth becomes a bit boring. You know, Earth is a, is a you know, beta or a delta uh, location and the real money is going off world. Uh, so, yeah. you know, think about the very long term, uh, there isn't any market there yet. You can't buy a property on Mars. You can't buy a property on a planet, you know, orbiting some faraway star. So uh, um, we, we can't even go down that road yet. Fair enough. So so for right now, we should be thinking about the next hundred years and not worry about it. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, so I'll just keep buying beach property and I won't worry about buying satellites around Saturn or something like that. Yeah, it, it really, I mean, as a futurist, people ask me all the time, well, we want to do uh, something of 20 years in the future, something 50 years and something 100. I say, well, 20 and 50 are fine. There's no point in doing the 100. Because in 100 years time, you've got a direct brain link to the IT. You've got a uh, genetic uh, modification capability to design any new kind of body you want and to inhabit that. Uh, you could make a, you know, J Jeffrey Holst Mark II, which is uh, uh, three inches tall with 100 times the IQ of the existing one, uh, which, you know, could, could do with a property which is only about a foot tall uh, and still thinks it's a mansion. So <laughs> it's, yeah. it, the, the future real estate market uh, c ceases to have any real meaning once you start getting into that level of technology. So really you can confine yourself to this side of 2100 and you're making sensible decisions. Beyond that, there really is no credibility well, in any decision. 
and we'll be much smarter then anyway so we'll be able to make better decisions exactly and we, we you'll be now. trying to sell to super smart ais that want uh, places as well so uh, there are lots and lots of new situations you got to look at for 2100 and beyond yeah yeah so so we'll stick on the we'll stick in the next little bit so you talk about um in one of your blog articles you talked about sort of new construction techniques and how yeah. that might impact things and you talked about something i thought was really interesting which is like one kilometer and then maybe even 10 kilometer tall buildings so tell us a little bit about that like how does that work and when do you think that might occur yeah well today you build buildings you know we used to build them out of wood and now we build them with steel skeletons and we build stuff around that steel um, but steel isn't very strong but now we're starting to make uh, buildings which are just over a kilometer tall you know those new ones in the middle east around about the kilometer level a little bit more than a kilometer but that's about the limits you're going to get with steel you couldn't go much more than two kilometers tall say but once you start looking at carbon materials things like graphene or carbon nanotubes you can build things really tall and i'm talking you know the, the theoretical limit with a graphene building uh is 600 kilometers tall and that means you know my, I mean, my sci-fi book you know my heroes live in a carbon building which is 600 kilometers tall and they look down onto the Hubble telescope. You know, it's uh, it's hundreds of kilometers below them, and you know they uh, the only thing above them is the other end of the space elevator, which is uh, you know tens of thousands of kilometers high. But uh, you know you could build a building literally 600 kilometers tall if you use graphene and carbon nanotubes as your materials. So if you think maybe by 2030, we'd be able to build buildings with a little bit of carbon composite in, maybe we can get a couple of kilometers routinely. By 2040, we'll be routinely building buildings uh, like spaceports and so on, which are up to 30 kilometers tall and maybe 50 kilometers tall by 2050. So the reason you want a spaceport, which is 50 kilometers tall, is because the higher off the ground you are, when you launch your rocket the less fuel it takes to get into space so if you're already halfway there i mean space is only one 100 kilometers up if you've got a building 50 kilometers tall uh, you're already halfway there you've already saved three quarters of your fuel so um it's a lot cheaper to get into space so your space ports will be really really high but you <clears throat> you really do not want to commute half an hour from the ground to your flat so uh uh, it'd be quite nice to have a building which is less than 10 kilometers tall if you want to live in it. But even 10 kilometers is hundreds of floors. You might have three, 400 floors in that building. So, you know, you're into the uh, Judge Dredd type scenarios with uh, Mega City One, which literally you've got the whole capacity of a city all in one building. And that, you can build that using carbon materials. So you might have uh, buildings which are hundreds of meters wide in each direction. So, you know, 100 meters by 100 meters is already one hectare floor level. Uh, that's already quite a few uh, houses in there. Um, and if you've got hundreds of, of layers tall, you've got, you know, thousands and thousands of houses uh, in, in that uh, accommodation. And so you would build it with, uh, you know, Judge Dredd that actually thought this thing through quite well. And they realized that you'd have some areas where people work, some areas where people play, some areas where people shop. Uh, and that's that's the way you would do it. So you'd have residential levels, and you'd be able to have so much stuff in that building, you would never need to leave. So some people literally would spend almost their whole life in that building. They might only leave to go to weddings and funerals uh, with some distant relative or something, but they'd be able to live their whole everyday life, just commuting to and from a different floor and uh, perfectly happy where they are. And they will have a very tribal instinct uh, they'll identify with the other people living in their city block and they'll think of the ones that live in the city block a few kilometers away as being you know the enemy or something you know, they, they just will not have any affinity with them it'll be like a foreign country uh, this uh, city block which they've heard of which is a few kilometers away they've never been outside so they've, they've got no experience that could be future life for millions of people yeah, so that kind of goes against <clears throat> your statement earlier about de-urbanization though, right? You said you thought that we were gonna de-urbanize and that sounds like extreme urbanization to me. Well, it's the thing is you, you, you're never gonna have everybody wealthy. If you look at the United States today, you've got some extraordinarily wealthy people and you've got quite a lot of people who are actually going to food banks in this situation. So you do have the extremes. 
And even in this far future, you will still have the Judge Dredd style mega buildings with the, 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 some poor people living in there, people who are disenfranchised for whatever reason. You know, they can't get a good job. They weren't blessed with the best brain when they were born or the best looks. You know, they can't get premium jobs. Uh, nobody wants to employ them. There are plenty of other people and plenty of AIs. So nobody wants them and they will not be very wealthy but majority of people will be, and they'll be able to go out to the suburbs, go out to the countryside and buy really pretty places. And so you will get a lot of de-urbanization. You will still have a lot of people living in the city, stuck in that city, who are disenfranchised from the, the wealth, basically. And so you will have both of those ends. What, what impact do you see? I read, you know, I read that article, and with respect to the, the tribalistic part of human nature sort of impacting that, you know, do you see where maybe some of that gets undone because of uh, human beings nature uh, to be a herd animal of sorts? Yeah, I, a lot of people today are trying to get rid of tribalism. You know, we see on the left particularly that uh, they want to pretend that they're not tribal. You know, they love everybody. They're, they want no borders. They want to pretend that there are uh, brothers and sisters to everybody else in the world. Well, great, you know, we'd all like that to be the case. But actually, uh, when push comes to shove, you like your next door neighbor a little bit better than the people in a different country. You like your friends and your relatives a lot better than the people even down the road or your Most. next door neighbors. So people are tribal. You know, you live in a unit, uh, you have an affinity with a small number of people. And even when we go on to things which are truly, truly global, I mean, I never, I've never met Jeffrey, but we've been communicating on, on, uh, on Twitter and so on. You know, I, I probably feel more in common with Jeffrey than I do with my next door neighbor. So there is still <laughs> tribalism in this social media land. And, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if you're told you're going to die tomorrow morning, you know, where would you leave all your wealth? You'd probably spend it all around your tribe and nobody else would get a look in. You know, nobody, no matter how left wing they are, would say, well, I want my wealth to be diluted equally between every single person in the world. Um, you know, they might hit all the right wing people, which is quite typical. So, you know, they want everybody who's left wing and agrees with them to inherit all their wealth. But nobody has got rid of tribalism. We're still tribal. It's built deeply into human nature. And when you start doing things in real estate, which encourage that tribalism, like forcing people into blocks of flats and so on, it increases that and it gives people a, a, a common uh, platform. You know, they all live in that area. They've all got this shared common problem uh, that, they, you know, the lifts are really slow or they, they get looked down on, they get ignored by the local authorities or government never looks after them properly. You know, these things bind them together and they get a tribal allegiance allegiance with everybody else who shares those same things. So they feel like a sort of a tribe. And that builds on that stuff which is already in your brain from hundreds of thousands of years ago. You can't get rid of it. You can pretend you've got rid of it, but as soon as there's any stress, uh, it comes immediately to the foreground as well. Yeah, that, that makes good sense. So let me ask this. So how do you feel? So a lot of our, our viewers um, are invested in residential real estate, but some of them invest in other types of real estate, like commercial office buildings, things like that. What do you, what do you see the trends on that stuff is? I mean, we, we're talking about, you know, buy, not, buy pretty places, but does that apply to offices or are people just not going to be at offices anymore? You know, this is, is one thing which has changed beyond recognition because of COVID. Uh, you know, COVID didn't come out of the blue. You know, we've been talking about uh, diseases and uh, epidemics and pandemics for the last 20 years as being the biggest threat in the 21st, in the 20th century, in 21st century, 22nd century. Uh, and nobody expects that we're going to get uh, uh, vaccines and antiviral things which are so well developed that we don't need to worry about these. And the biggest threats facing humanity, uh, in my top three for the last 20 years, pandemics have been in there. And they have for most futurists and futurologists and uh, in everybody in biology has been saying, you know, this is a really big problem, especially since we're running out of antibiotics and so on. Uh, we can't ignore that biological threat. Now, the biggest things which make that biological threat big are uh, free or almost free air travel, which we have, you know, it costs almost nothing to fly to the other side of the world these days. So people routinely do it. It used to cost a fortune. You know, you'd spend a whole uh, year's salary on flying anywhere. Uh, now you can do it for a few hundred dollars. You can go across the Atlantic. So, you know, what's the problem? It's virtually free. 
Um, also, people have been moving into cities. We've got between 60 and 80 percent of the world's population living in cities or suburbs, depending where you draw those boundaries. And uh, in fact, we can't get much more urbanization because everybody's over, already almost in those cities. There's only a few people left to go. Um, so everybody's already urbanized. Um, this is a really big problem because uh, diseases spread according to proximity. If you're close to other people, you're going to spread that disease. And uh, the R number that we're all talking about, uh, if you're in a city, it's going to go through the roof. So we're all working from home. We're not allowed to have any uh, communication. We've got to have social distancing because they've got fewer population and more space. But uh, for commercial property, it's a biggie because we're all discovering that we can actually work from home. Uh, we've got these things, you know, like Zoom and Skype and what have you. They're not very good, but you know, we've only just started playing with them. They're going to get an awful lot better uh, in a couple of years time you'll be able to connect them to your nervous system and shake, shake hands with people or kiss or cuddle them. Uh, you'll be able to feel those sensations. It'll be full 3D, full high resolution, full HDR graphics and so on. Um, it will be really high quality in a few years time. Why would you want to go to the office? So uh, if you've been investing in real estate in the middle of the city and everybody's moving out of the city, all of the people owning the big office blocks are selling them all. Uh, for example, Barclays in London have recently announced they're going to get rid of an awful lot of their property because they can't see the point of holding on to it when 80% of their people can work from home. So, you know, Barclays is going to sell an awful lot of very, very prime real estate in the middle of London, uh, you know, one of the most expensive property areas around. Uh, lots of other big banks and very wealthy big global companies are going to get rid of their stuff too. Uh, it might even become... Uh, latched on to the next big thing coming, which of course is the green thing, you know, getting rid of uh, carbon signatures and environmentalism, uh, wanted to make uh, less CO2 uh, signature. Um, I'm not a big supporter of that, you know, myself, but it's uh, uh, a lot of people do believe in that. That will uh, capitalize on this existing trend and cause people to stay at home and not go back into their offices. I would not want to be holding commercial real estate at the moment because uh, a lot of those renewals will not be renewed when they come up. Uh, people will not want to rent those prime uh, properties. And if they do, they're going to expect a huge discount in what they're paying for them because nobody wants to work in a city anymore. They don't have to. Uh, why should they? They can save two hours a day commute time and they can still do their job. What's the incentive? All the I'm incentives that they used to be are disappearing. What was that, Brian? We, we couldn't quite hear you there. I said, as someone who's originally from Los Angeles, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah, mean, I, I think that, um, you know, th this is not, none of this happens in a vacuum, right? It's not like tomorrow everyone's moving out of the office. This is a trend that's existed for a while. Yeah. The way I analyze it is um, this COVID thing is accelerating the trend that already existed. And, and I think that's kind of what you're saying, right? I mean, yeah, this is going to exactly speed right. it up. The technology yeah. is getting better. Um, people are using Zoom. They're getting used to it. I always say, you know, there's a lot of, um, in, in the U.S., a lot of baby boomers not comfortable working from home. The first few weeks of, of the shutdown, they were saying, oh, I'm having all these IT problems. But they figured these things out. They're forced to figure them out because they want to keep working. And now once they have, some of them aren't coming back. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I wrote blogs on this, you know, two or three years ago that uh, we're going to see de-urbanization because the technology is catching up. Uh, but, you know, my job, uh, I do a lot of face-to-face -face consultancy. I do a lot of face-to-face -face TV where they insist you've got to be in the studio uh, because, you know, that's the way they do it. And a lot of people insist on face-to-face -face meetings. And they do that, especially in the service sector, they want face-to-face. -face. But now that we've all had a few weeks of practice, you know, reluctantly, but we've all had this few weeks of practice. We've discovered it's not the end of the world. You can still talk to somebody. You can still see a smile. You've still got some sort of emotional communication, which is a lot better than just a telephone. You know, you've still got uh, uh, gestures and so on. You can see people waving their arms around, or you can see, a, you know, facial uh, gesticulations and so on. So it's, uh, we're gradually getting there in terms of the uh, the tech is able to 
transport you to be effectively right next to somebody. They give this a few years time, you know, the augmented reality, the virtual reality technology will catch up. You'd be able to make it 3D, you'd be able to make it completely immersive. You'd be able to record and replay sensations into your nervous system. So you will be able to make that almost full sensory uh, communication. You'll still know that the person isn't really there. It won't be quite the same as being there, but it'll be pretty good. And that pretty good is enough, you know, if you're thinking you're, you're going to save two hours a day, which is two hours more you can spend with your kids or two hours more you can spend playing computer games, whatever you want to do, it's two hours a day you used to spend when or when I'm going to work. Uh, that's a big incentive to put up with that small drop in the communication quality of knowing that the person isn't actually right in front of you. So do you think some of that will be offset, though, by um, technology that allows people to basically do those kind of things during their commute? Because, you know, if you have a self-driving car, you're on a, a, a metro or something, <clears throat> and you can sure. put on a VR headset or you have active lens contacts like you like to talk about, and you're yeah. immersing yourself, <clears throat> it, you really aren't wasting that time as much, right? I mean, you're, that, that commute time is being utilized in a different fashion. Maybe you are hanging out with your kids during your commute because you have the, that uh, immersive reality. Yeah, there is a lot of that. I think you, you can use a commute that way. I mean, not just yet. And it'll be another five or six years before the self-drive technology is safe enough uh, for the insurance companies to take that risk, I think. And it will be insurance companies that are the problem here. Um, so you will get to that point. And you, you, you could use the future commute for doing those sorts of things. But... Uh, you know, people will still say, well, why should I do the commute? You know, I can just stay in bed. Uh, you know, I can't do that in the car. Um, so it's, uh, I might as well just stay in bed for an extra hour in the morning and go to bed an hour earlier in the evening and I can have a better uh, lifestyle. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any black and white in here. Uh, all you can say is that there are some trends pushing this direction, some trends pushing that direction, and personal choice and personal preferences are a huge factor in all of this. Some people will think, well, you know, sure, I can do all of this, but, you know, I still want to meet people face to face. So I will still jump through those hoops and still do the commute. Other people will say, well, no, the technology is good enough for me. I'm quite happy with that. I'll put up with the uh, slight degradation in quality of communication and I will work from home and take the enormous improvement in my personal quality of life. So it is a personal choice thing. And that's where technology ceases to have the impact. You can't predict. Uh, exactly what someone's personal choice will be. All you can say is, well, they'll have a choice of doing this, or they'll have a choice of doing that. Uh, some will probably choose this, some will choose that. Are there other factors like cost? Well, probably not, because the technology will be dirt cheap, but so will the travel. You know, it's a self-driving car, there's no taxi driver to pay, it's just a pod, uh, the electricity doesn't cost much. It's probably produced by renewables or fusion reactors or something. So, you know, there's not much cost either. There's a significant factor. Uh, the technology makes it not much different either way. It will come down to very personal emotional decisions, which are very difficult to predict. Well, it might not even come down to the individual worker's decision, right? The 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 person well, who runs the company might say, I'm not going to pay well, for I have this a office too, space. Of course. Right? Like, <laughs> I'm, you're going to work from you home. Might have a big saying that sure yeah um but i think uh, all of that uh, you know when you're presenting a, a negotiation with somebody who owns a piece of prime real estate in the middle of a big city and you're thinking of setting up in that big city and you're talking to them uh, that is going to be right there on the table saying well i don't need this property i can get away without using it so you know what's your best price uh you know per square foot on this property because if you charge me too much, I can walk away. Uh, I don't need to have that property. If it's a little bit too much, few cents per year, uh, I can still walk away. So I really need you to shave this to the, uh, to the, to the limits. And so I think that the days where you could really milk uh, real estate and make big margins are probably over. And it'll be much harder to get a good return on commercial property. Uh, that's not quite so good for a residential property. I think that the uh, uh, we we tend to build those in in a nicer to look at areas. Some are in nice areas, some not quite so nice areas, but they all tend to be in the suburbs, suburbs or the or the pretty places. Um, you know, there's uh, 
a, a lot of people with a lot of money to spend, so there will be a differential there. But I, I think you can still make a good margin on probably any of that property as long as it's well built and uh, you can give somebody a good quality of life. So I, I think there's still a fairly safe investment for residential real estate and very risky investment uh, for the next decade or two uh, for commercial real estate. I, if I was holding a lot of uh, spaces in the middle of a city at the moment, I would be very nervous, very worried, hoping to get rid of that very quickly uh, before the next epidemic comes along. And there will be another epidemic. And guess what? The next one won't be 0.1% death rate. The next one might be 5 or 10 or 20 or 50% death rate. Uh, it could be a lot worse than this COVID. So, you know, b before that comes, and it will come, uh, you really need to unload a lot, of the, a lot of those city properties and maybe reinvest in some very nice areas out of town, uh, you know, persuading some of your uh, friends in government to release a little bit of pretty area somewhere from the regulations so you can invest and build some properties there. Uh, that's what I would be trying to do because pretty is never going to go out of style. Well, listen, you know what? That seems like a solid uh, solid place to wrap up. So you heard it from Dr. Pearson. <laughs> we should all be buying beach properties and mountain properties and getting rid of our city properties. Um, any any last words of wisdom for, from you, uh, Dr. Pearson? Yeah, I would just add a single caveat to that is remember, I'm not a specialist in real estate. I interpret what I've said with your own, your own intelligence, your own knowledge, your own know-how and uh, take it with a pinch of salt otherwise. Uh, well, listen, we really appreciate you coming on. It's been great talking to you. I feel like I've known you forever, and this is the first time we've ever had an opportunity to talk. We should definitely do this again. So we'll check we in in about 50 years and see how accurate you were. Um, <laughs> you, think you're gonna, you think you're gonna make it to uh, radical life extension technology? Well, I will need to be 110 to get to there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not optimistic about that one. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Well, we better check in a little bit sooner than that. Then thank you again for coming on. We it's really appreciate it. Good talking to you, Jeffrey. Thank yeah, you, thank Brian. you. Appreciate it. Cheers.